Module 5, Relational Summary Lecture GNE1 of Grades and Slopes and the Effects of Latitude. The ecology of the North has provided the most iconic imagery in the campaign to raise awareness and concern, and in many cases, outrage over the consequences of global warming. And it is global warming that we're talking about here, here in the extreme North, not mere climate change. Make no mistake about it, the Earth is gradually warming. That is to say that the average temperature of the entire globe is going up steadily, as this graph shows. Despite occasional swings up and down and bizarre springtime dips like the polar vortices, the trend line is ever up, and that's what counts. When you plot a slope through all those points on the graph, the gradation is not just on an incline, but gets ever steeper. And perhaps more important than the gradation here is the degradation it is causing to our climate buffering environments, soils and forests and wetlands and reefs and glaciers and ice packs. Oh my. This creates a very dangerous positive feedback loop that adds to the rising slope of the curve. Now my father, John Culhane, who worked for Disney as a writer and historian, taught me at a young age that one of the keys to good art, whether writing, drawing, and painting, filmmaking, performance, or presentation, were what he referred to as grooch, gradation, repetition, unity, contrast, and harmony. He helped us remember these principles of effective communication by saying that this is how the grooch stole Christmas and our hearts and minds. Now, the gradual rise of average temperature is threatening to steal not just Christmas and the North Pole, but all the gifts our once abundant planet could provide. Admittedly, the image of an emaciated mother polar bear and her vulnerable cubs stuck on a tiny isolated and dissolving ice flow in the middle of an ever-warming blue-black sea, miles from land, can steal your heart. The stark contrast between the bright, cold, white specks of mammal fur and ice flow against the dark, solar radiation-absorbing ocean evokes an emotional response. The unity between perishing mammal and diminishing mass of unfreezing water creates an immediate understanding that as one goes, so goes the other. On the other hand, the healthy multi-hued gradations of land to sea in areas still not as impacted by global warming suggest a possible harmony that we can get back to if we decide it's preferable for us humans to change our practices rather than changing the climate to suit our gray cities and the agro-industrial complexes that support them. And because what is happening in the North Pole is being repeated in Greenland and Iceland and Siberia and Canada, the message resounds as truth. There can be no hoax in this. The ice and the so-called permafrost, which was so named because relative to our human experience, we thought it was permanent, is melting. Get that, the, the permafrost isn't permanent or frosted frozen anymore. And it's releasing prodigious amounts of once trapped methane that the original climate models didn't account for. Nobody can honestly ignore. And the northern hemisphere, with its overwhelming preponderance of seasonally snow-bedecked land masses and glaciers and permafrost and sea ice, is bearing witness to the obvious fact that the globe is warming. For political reasons, mostly because people with poor thought processes couldn't understand how the average temperature of a spinning planet going up could cause polar vortices that displace the gradually warming but still ice-cold air down south, the science communications community had to change the words to the nebulous term climate change, which I'm unhappy with because it suggests no vector and in turn gets people confused about the differences between weather, a local regional short-term phenomenon, and true climate, a global and long-term larger scale regime of weather patterns and between magnitudes of change, sudden swings in temperature, heat waves, and cold snaps, and rates of change, a catastrophic rise in global average temperatures of two degrees in just one or two generations, leading many to declare, well, climates always change, what of it? Well, that's easy for the folks living in the million dollar apartments of cozy Trump Tower to say, subsidized by cheap fossil fuels imported from faraway lands, secure in their access to cheap subsidized fresh food, mostly imported from the global south, for year-round season-independent consumption, because they have perfect building level and refrigerator and room level climate control during the sweltering summers and frigid winters and sudden heat waves and cold snaps throughout the climatically crazy year. 
Those with wealth and privilege don't usually suffer and die when the weather patterns become erratic and dangerous as the overall climate regimes become unpredictable. They aren't trapped when it becomes impossible to go outside and when local agriculture fails. They live with the certainty that the services and machinery they can afford will keep them buffered from all but apocalyptic changes. But the rest of us who live in the North, particularly those who live dependent on the ecology of the North, live a different story. Some of us remember the gradations of the seasons, the gradual changes that happened rhythmically and repeatedly year after year, cycle after cycle. And the indigenous peoples of the North almost universally felt the unity of man and biosphere that their lives depended on. They understood the contrasts between, on the one hand, the homeostasis needed by animals and the slow adaptation needed by plants to survive the contrasts of the seasons, and they applied the principles of harmony needed to make a living in the ecology of the North. You see, we didn't evolve in the North. Whether Neanderthals or woolly mammoths, we all came from subtropical hominids and elephants who slowly, slowly adapted to the environmental vicissitudes of the North. That hominids and elephantids were able to migrate northward and eventually adapt so well to winter ecologies that they could survive repeated ice ages is a testimony to the sheer stability of the climate over long periods of time. Changes were rarely sudden and mostly predictable, even when they became horribly uncomfortable for thousands of years at a time. Despite repeated ice ages, most climate change in the past occurred gradually enough for organisms to adapt. And that isn't the case anymore. Yes, climate change is natural, but this time its nature is different. This time we humans, who are arguably, yes, very much a part of nature, have engineered a climate change trend whose rate of change is accelerating so fast that for many of the Earth's inhabitants there simply is no time to adapt. And see, here's the thing. I said at the beginning of the lecture, that the globe was warming gradually, and so you would think that such gradations of rising degrees centigrade would permit ad adaptation. But there are two weird and seemingly opposing phenomena happening that confuse things. The first is the rate of change relative to human perception. In the superb independent climate change awareness documentary film How to Boil a Frog from about a decade ago by my friend John Cooksey, released in 2010, Global warming is compared to a pot of water with a frog in it. The mythology is that a frog's nervous system isn't able to detect temperature changes of less than a degree per minute or so. This implies that if you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, it will jump out instantly. But if you put it in a pot of cool water and ever so slowly bring it to a boil, the frog will not be able to notice the gradations and will stay there until it's too late, boiling to death. Now, never mind that the story is apocryphal, for even if it isn't true for frogs, it certainly seems to be true for the political system of humans. Now, from an ecological viewpoint, considering the possibility of ecosystem collapse, it is getting too late for us to jump out, too late for us to turn back very quickly. But the changes aren't happening quickly enough for the slow nervous system of our governments or industries, whose perceptions are buffered by the greatest transfer of wealth upwards to the top percent in history. And even the richest people on Earth can't jump out of this pot of hot water yet, Elon Musk's red Tesla Roadster orbiting Mars notwithstanding. Now the other problem is the extreme and erratic bounces within the trend lines. Sudden heat waves and unprecedented and unpredictable cold snaps, out-of-season temperature swings on predictably large El Nino and La Nina systems, sudden formation of high-intensity storms, and the erratic onset of droughts and floods and fires, all of these wreck havoc with people and other organisms that evolved in systems with enough predictability that, for example, we humans were able to create a farmer's almanac and plant our crops by it reliably. And a system predictable enough that birds and butterflies and wildebeest and whales were able to develop complex and enduring seasonal migration patterns. And now those regularities are not just at risk, but are disappearing. Things are so unpredictable at the local level that despite the perfectly predictable global outcomes of global warming, by which I mean the inevitable melting of glaciers and ice caps, the inevitable rising sea levels and coastal destruction and erosion, the inevitable extinction of megafauna, the disruption of the thermal ocean conveyor belt, all that, we can with confidence say we are in the grips of intensifying local climate uncertainty. Local. 
The uncertainty isn't about global warming or about the ecological devastation it's bringing. It's about how human political systems on the ground will respond. That's why many scientists now refer to the phenomenon not as mere climate change, but as climate disruption. And if things are swinging so wildly that we can't predict the overall weather, can we really be said to have a climate per se? You see, in Greek and later in Latin, klima actually meant slope. It referred to the predictable zones of general weather patterns and average temperatures between different latitudes on the Earth's surface. Climatology was the study of those gradations, those slopes. People long ago charted how the average temperature taken over a year sloped gradually downwards as you moved from the equator north or south. Going north, you would encounter winter cold just as assuredly as you would encounter cold going up the slope of a mountain. People noticed similar changes in biome distribution with elevation and latitude. At the top of the mountain, you would find glaciers, and at the top of the world, you would find glaciers. Hence, the notion of climate was born, all about predictable slopes. The animals and plants knew it too, hence the similarity of the biomes. So climate change literally means slope zone change. And those who argue that, well, the climate has always been changing, are only speaking in half-truths. See. There were times when the continents were distributed differently than they are today, times when today's young mountains like the Himalayas and Sierra Nevadas and the Swiss Alps, today's tallest mountains, not yet eroded down, were nowhere to be seen. And this was only about 50 million years ago, around the time that elephants and whales first began to appear on Earth. Remember that the dinosaurs went extinct some 65 million years ago. Old, eroded mountain ranges, like the Barberton Greenstone Belt in South Africa, date back 3.6 billion years to a time before there was any life besides microbes on the planet at all. Now, the big mountains with the famous peaks like Everest and the Matterhorn and the big slopes leading up to them, slopes wonderful for expert skiing, began to emerge in the Eocene, which occurred between 53 and 49 million years ago, an epoch credited with starting out as the Earth's warmest temperature period for a hundred million years. Wiki reminds us, however, that this super greenhouse Earth eventually became an ice house by the late Eocene. The mountains had something to do with that. As Wikipedia tells us, the position of mountains influences climate, such as rain or snow. When air masses move up and over mountains, the air cools, producing orographic precipitation, rain or snow. As the air descends on the leeward side, it warms again following the adiabatic lapse rate and is drier, having been stripped of much of its moisture. Often a rain shadow will affect the leeward side of a range." End quote. So of course climate change is natural and has always occurred. Plate tectonics, the movement of the Earth's lithosphere, make sure of that. Because as continents drift around the globe and pull apart creating subduction zones and smash together building mountain slopes, they get affected by their position relative to the tilt of the Earth and its shape, and they in turn affect the winds and waves and tidal forces and the currents and the distribution of water around the planet, how air heats up and rises and cools and falls, carrying moisture from one region to another or taking it away. Mountains rise and fall, and they create micro and macro climate effects. But mountains are pushed up and pummeled down over eons, and continental drift occurs over eons, and the slopes these processes create change so slowly with regard to the evolution of life forms that fairly stable niches are formed along the way that have allowed for the coevolution of remarkably delicate symbioses. Now, this is important to keep in mind. And the north, that vast region of landmass that today is crowded with continents like never before in history, is where the climate changed the most from the way it had been before the continents broke up and then smashed together again in these new configurations that we live in. Remember that Pangaea, the mashup of all the continents some 200 million years ago when dinosaurs ruled the Earth, the Jurassic Park era after the Triassic when the dinosaurs first appeared and before the Cretaceous when they went extinct, spanned north and south fairly evenly. Of course the climate changed when it split apart, and by the way, there is a great interactive map online now where you can see where your house was on Pangaea. There's the link you can click right down there. So um, go ahead and click. But look, the dinosaurs as a group lasted over 165 million years 
and obviously the climatic shifts that occurred happened slowly enough that they were able to adapt until the final catastrophic extinction event that defines the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary after which we entered the Cenozoic or the Age of Mammals. And it was in the north on those new land masses with those new mountain ranges that massive mammals finally found a home, home on the range. Homes with climates so predictable that they were able to migrate up to the very top of the world and back down again in migration patterns that persist to this day. Now those patterns are being disrupted. The patterns are changing so quickly that the animals can't establish new rhythms, but then again so slowly relative to the rhythms of our economy that economically comfortable human animals don't want to disrupt their social status quo in order to mitigate and protect the climatic status quo. So we have a dynamic climate and a static economic order. And the worst thing about the overlap between them is that some politicians who misunderstand the science have made claims that there's nothing to worry about, as that president of the most powerful northern country on Earth, Ronald Reagan, did in the 1980s when asked about climate change and environmental pollution, saying, well, the scientists tell me man will adapt. But will we? And we really must ask which man or which men, because evolution is hard on those that cannot adapt in time, and due to the harshness of this reality, most of us want to mitigate climate change, not just try and adapt to it. Ecology also teaches us that there are winners and losers in the adaptation game, and we know by looking at how humans have adapted to harsh and hostile environments, not just on this planet, like, like barren deserts, like Death Valley, and ice shelves in Antarctica, but on the moon and in near-Earth orbit, that if you have the money and the resources, the climate doesn't matter so much to you. The sun still shines, geothermal energy still glows, and if you have stockpiled fossil fuels and uranium and have the technology and labor to exploit them, you can go for a long, 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 long time. The kinks for long-term survival in a truly hostile climate are still being worked out, but the Biosphere 2 experiment in the Arizona desert, bankrolled by oil tycoon Ed Bass, showed that we can create an air sats ecology that can sustain us if you're rich enough and if you have the intellectual and social capital to sustain the technology and if you have the right personal dynamics. In the 1990s, I was invited by NASA's Challenger Center to be one of seven space science teachers to enter the biosphere and meet the biospherians before it was closed for the two-year trial. I visited again after Columbia University took it over and very recently went back inside with the Arizona Science Teachers Association to deliver a speech inside. And what we've learned over these years is that the Biosphere 2 experiment didn't really fail. It just showed the limitations of our social maturity. The experiment in living inside it in a hermetically sealed state mostly fell apart because of political infighting. The habitats and their ecologies are still more or less thriving under new management, and we are getting closer and closer to figuring out how to keep the ecology from the problems it faced during the lockdown dropping oxygen levels, that was mostly because of the concrete still curing, bee and pollinator populations plummeting, that was due to low ultraviolet radiation light penetration, certain other insects getting out of control, suggesting a need for better integrated pest management since they couldn't apply any poisons in the sealed enclosure. Scientists and engineers in the north, in the US and Canada and Europe, are using some of their great wealth now to figure out how to keep ecologies going in the frigid environments of space and the moon and Mars. Nothing that happens to this planet will ever be as harsh as those places already are. So there really is no point in trying to flee the Earth and colonize another planet to get out of dealing with climate change. And the wealthiest few, whether out there or down here, will be able to afford to live in engineered biospheres that keep them safe. To paraphrase Reagan, we should say, well, rich men will adapt. So climate disruption is really about environmental justice for the rest of us, for the other 90%. And when you look at it, even visionaries like Jacques Fresco here in Florida with his ambitious and equity-oriented Venus project can't provide safe havens for the majority of us. So we really have only one chance and one choice while the slope of climate change is still gradual enough that mitigation is possible and the disruption still far enough apart to experiment with at the local level without everything we build and hold most precious being torn apart. We the people, 
must create sustainable ecologies that are robust enough to simultaneously mitigate the rate of change and adapt to the inevitable disruptions that the current and legacy carbon and nitrox loads in the atmosphere will cause to our natural ecology. We, the people of the North, have to do it because, as we will discuss in our political ecology lectures, our cultures have already so disrupted the natural and social ecologies of the places south of us that the so-called Global South is mired in poverty and in coordination with North Country policies, using the South as extractive economies, supporting, aiding, and abetting that corruption and inefficiency and wholesale ecological destruction. You only have to see what Bolsonaro is doing to the Amazon right now to get that. We, the people of the North, have to be the ones to revive and enhance global ecological systems, and not by parachuting into the poorer countries and telling them to get their ecology straight, preaching to them about the value of their forests and coastal areas, but by demonstrating how much we value our ecologies here in the North, by rewilding and reclaiming our forests and wetlands and prairies and kelp, and by starting in our own literal backyards and front yards, making them ecological carbon and nitrogen sinks, filled with biodiversity and sustainably grown food, filled with hope and abundance. There are many drawdown solutions we can apply to make things comfortable for humans, and I'd like to just touch on two that I've encountered in my journeys to the north. One is, of course, wind turbine power, solution number two in our book. With onshore power, such as I first witnessed on Block Island off the coast of Rhode Island in the northeast U.S. as a high school student on a diving trip in 1978, and on an office building in the city of Dublin and towering over homes and factories on many islands off the coast of Ireland and in cities in Germany and Belgium and in the Swiss Alps as a graduate student 17 years ago, reducing 84.6 gigatons of CO2 by 2050 at a net cost of $1.23 trillion, yielding a net savings of $7.4 trillion. And then there is the no-brainer that many Northerners still can't seem to understand. Solar hot water. Solution number 41, reducing an estimated 6.08 gigatons at a measly net cost of $3 billion, the whopping net savings of $773.7 .7 billion. And I know what you may be thinking, how can solar hot water be a solution for the north, particularly the far north? How can it work in the cold? I used to think that too. But then I visited the solar pyramid on the glacier near Mount Everest base camp at the top of the world and saw how comfortable the scientists living there were and visited the solar-heated geodesic domes nestled in the snow and ice at Mount Everest Base Camp itself, and then installed my own vacuum tube solar hot water system for the villagers of Dingboche at the Mountain Institute Lodge, and I felt it for myself. How can I ever forget that frigid, sunny Sunday morning when I finished installing two small wind turbines and a 50-tube solar hot water system, and then a long line of villagers gathered, shivering beneath me with buckets, it doesn't matter how cold the weather is, how cold the climate gets, even in an ice age, if the sky is clear and the sun is shining, the principle of the greenhouse effect, safely contained within boxes or tubes of glass acting as solar collectors, turns photons of visible light into infrared radiation, into heat. I was able to fill each villager's bucket with a miracle of steaming hot water for them to take home and bathe their children with and, and cook with without cutting one more threatened rhododendron tree, preserving the Nepalese forests, without burning the last endangered, ancient, slow-growing juniper shrubs at the edge of the glacier that my colleague and Nat Geo expedition leader, Dr. Alton Byers, was working with the Sherpa community to save. With wind power and solar hot water alone, we can go a long way toward recovering the fragile ecology of the North. And these are just two of the most regionally appropriate of the 100 drawdown solutions that I've personally witnessed and implemented. With all the solutions in play, the North should never have to rape the resources of its own or any other regions of the globe. For it was the perception that lands with seasonal winters couldn't support rising populations that gave popular support to the campaigns of exploitation and Northern imperialist expansion in the first place, right? We need to end this false perception. The ecology of the North was once so rich and giving that the first humans didn't turn back to the South, but kept exploring it with enthusiasm and hope, pushing up to the tops of mountains and to the top of the world. The Inuit actually settled there in the Arctic Circle, building comfortable igloos from the ice and never thinking of migrating back to the tropics like the birds and whales they subsisted on. 
It was once so rich that even ice ages couldn't stop us from developing art and culture and celebrating the abundance through our cave paintings and figurines and songs and dances and myths. And the greatest thing is, if we can apply our new knowledge of ecological science here in the North, we can lead the world, which still looks to us for leadership, in a new form of climate change, using ecology to change the climate for the better.